projector. All right, we are in uh, just starting section, uh, cha yeah, section 5.8 in chapter 5. Uh, the title is Further Transcendental Functions. And I'm sorry I forgot to turn the projector on, so it's still coming up. Um, do any uh, do you know what we mean by transcendental function? Okay. Basically, it's this is not probably the best way to say it, but it's kind of like it's any function other than your power functions. That's not quite accurate, but you know your linear function, quadratic functions, cubic functions. Those are your power functions. Anything beyond that. You know, those are your transcendental functions. What's that? I can't hear. Oh, this is 5.8, page 313 in the new text. Okay? I'm still waiting for PowerPoint to arrive. It's getting ready to be projected, but I have to change it on my screen because this is what uh, Screencast-O-Matic records. So, well, there we go. Okay. Now, just to give you a feel for it, now, <clears throat> I've said before anything other than power functions. That may not be true. I can't recall if they consider trig functions as transcendental functions or not. I think probably not. <clears throat> so except for the power functions and trig functions, uh, and probably some others, um, rational functions probably are not considered transcendental. So there are plenty others that aren't. But here are some that are. The log function, the exponential function, and then those like that. Okay? Now, um, and, and basically what I want to say, though I'm not absolutely certain it's, it's accurate, those that are defined as infinite series. But we're not going to do them that way, but that's really what they are. Okay? Um, and we're going to come back to this figure, uh, but let's start with this. Let me get my pen set up. Okay. What is uh, integration considered to be? The anti derivative. It undoes derivation. So let's go through some of these. Remind ourselves what is the derivative of, say, log x? This is so aggravating. What's the derivative of log x? Remember? Second? No. Derivative of x would be 1. Derivative of log x is? Second? No. Um, derivative of a constant is 0. 7, 4 thirds, i fifths, you know. Any constant would be for the derivative of that would be 0. Derivative of the log function, this is natural log, is 1 over x. Got it? Remember? Okay. Now, so what might you guess the integral of 1 over x dx to be? Integration undoes derivation. Deri derivative. What would this be? It would be the antiderivative of 1 over the x. Then. It would be log x. Now, <coughs> Howdy. Uh, I just had a question. 
like some extra classes one and I can't I don't know if I missed a test or anything, but no, there were no tests. Just so more review and everything. Well, it's uh, we continued and we finished three four and started three five. Okay, okay, yeah, I definitely struggled with that. Okay, and it is being uploaded to YouTube now, and as soon as it gets there, well, sometime after noon, I'll get it over into Blackboard. Okay, but okay. all the previous classes are in Blackboard. Yes, sir. Yeah. All right, thank yeah. You. under content. Yes, under content. Right. Yes, sir. Uh, I can't believe it walk right into a class. Okay. Now, there's one little thing you have to do here. And this is something special about logs. Okay. Um, you cannot take the log of zero, and you cannot take the log of any negative number. If you did the graph of log x, goes to the vertical asymptote to the zero for negative infinity, okay. x equal one is zero, and then it continues on. So it's sort of in shape like that. It's exactly the inverse of Ethan's hex. Quite totally uh, uh, identity element. Okay. So because of that, you never, unless you know what values you're dealing with, you always have to put in absolute value, okay? If you're doing derivative of log x, you're assuming that x is a value for which it's defined, and it's 1 over x. Those x's are always positive. Never negative, never zero. But if you're integrating, then you have to do absolute value to make sure you take your log of positive numbers. Okay. And here's the silver. Now, the first thing they do in the book is then do this. Uh, and I've got it a little different. Oh, oh, oh. If we did an indefinite integral, you'd also have your plus C. You should have warned me about that, right? But you have to value. But if you put in values here, definite integral A to B, then what would that be? Okay, that would be the log, now, yeah, of x evaluated from a to b, and that would be log b minus log a, right? Now, again, technically, I should be putting my absolute values here because you want to make sure those are positive numbers. You can't take the log, natural log, of a negative number or of zero. Now, <clears throat> therefore, either A and B are both positive or A and B are both negative. You can't have A being negative and B being positive or vice versa because then you cross zero and you can't, it's not defined there. <clears throat> so, uh, as long as A and B have the same sign, they can either be positive or negative. But do, do either of you remember the rule of property of logarithms? If you have the difference of two logs, what's that the same as? The natural log of the B over A. That's one of the rules of logarithms. Okay? Now, if you are a little fuzzy on those and this type of thing, I have to check both places. Um, what's that? If you go to the front inside part of your book, there's a cardstock page there that has algebra and they have laws of exponents, <clears throat> but they don't have the logs of of laws of logarithms. If you turn over to the next page, they have trigonometry, but again, they don't have the laws for um, logarithms, which I find strange. Let me see before I go any further. I should have looked before I started talking. 
in the back of the book, you have some more of those hard, hard stop pages. Um, the last several of those are integration tables. And then the page before that, you have differentiation. And the page before that, you have your exponential and logarithmic functions. Okay? Uh, page before that, you have your elementary functions. So basically, these, this property I just gave you, um, if you go over to the right-hand side, they don't number these pages, but that, that one has exponential and logarithmic functions at the top. <coughs> if you see there, <coughs> sorry, I can't talk. Uh, log base A of Y over X is log base A of X minus log base A of Y. Well, if you're using natural logs, that'd be ln uh, X over Y would be ln X minus ln Y. Here we have ln B minus ln A, so that's ln of B divided by A. Okay, so it's sort of buried there, but it's there. And by the way, everything on this page are transcendental functions. I uh, can't remember if inverse trig functions are counted trig transcendental or not. I don't remember, but everything on that page is transcendental. All right, now notice what else you get to do here. Remember I said the B and A are either both positive or both negative. They can't cross zero because you can't integrate across an undefined quantity, okay? Because 1 over X is not defined. 1 over 0 is not defined. So you have to stay either positive or negative, okay? Well, if both of these are positive, then you don't need the absolute value signs at all. But if both of them are negative, you might need them here, but down here, that would be minus over minus. That would be a positive number. So you don't need the absolute values there. That's just a side point. But that's how they got their first little thing in the book. Now, <clears throat> then they have this slide. Okay? What they're doing here is here's your function. Y is equal to 1 over T. And if you integrate that from 1 to X, okay, then integrate 1 over x, or 1 over t, from 1 to x. That would have a 1 here and an x up there. <coughs> Let's do that one. Lost my pen. That would then be the integral from 1 to x of 1 over t dt, just like we just did. That would be the log. Now here I don't need to put absolute value bars because your x's here are all positive. So we don't have to put absolute value bars. That would be the log of t evaluated from 1 to x. Okay? Well, what would that be then? Log of x minus log of 1. And what is the log of 1? Try it and see. ln of 1. Zero. So this would just be log x. Okay? So that is technically another definition for what log x is. It's the integral from 1 to x of 1 over t dt. Okay? So in other words, it's the area under this curve, 1 over t. Okay? The area here is log x. Just what you want. All right? Okay. And that leads then to this definition here. Whoa, where did that come from? Ah, there it is. That leads to this definition. They had it beforehand. I'll blow this up so it's easier to read. That's exactly what we just said. But they also throw in the caveat 
x has to be greater than zero. <clears throat> now, I'm going to go back to the picture a minute. But what if x was greater than zero but less than one? Then this would be a negative value here, wouldn't it? Because you're going from one to say 0 0.5, from one to 0 0.1, or one to 0 0.001, or one to two thirds, or whatever, you know, you'd have the bigger number of bottom and the smaller on top. That would give you a number, negative of an integral, but that'd be minus the log x, but you'd be going from one to a number less than one. Well, the log of a number less than one is negative, and negative and negative is positive, so you would get a positive area. So this is why you would get, uh, let's go back to this way, yeah. If you're integrating anywhere from here to one, or one to here, that's a negative area because you're doing it backwards, but then this is the... Uh, the log of something less than one is negative, so that gives you a positive area from here. Okay. But you notice you can't let it go to zero because this is missing. Okay. It's not defined. Okay. So that would give you the right answer if x was less than one or greater than zero, or any x greater than one. Certainly that would be the right answer. Okay. Good deal. Now. Okay. In a similar fashion, we can express, I guess I'll go on to the next one, sine x. Let me, this flip slides on me, and I wasn't paying attention to it, and I wrote some on it. Okay. In a similar fashion, we can express the inverse sine of x as a definite integral using the derivative formula from section 3.8, which hopefully you had in Cal 1. Let's do what the derivative of inverse sine is. There, it did it again. I swear this is so bizarre. It did it again. Okay. There's something about if my pen goes somewhere over here and I can't tell where it is, then it goes to the next page. So it's really strange. Okay. Does anyone know that derivative? And I'll confess, yes, I know it, but I never trust my memory. I look it up because the only difference in it and cosine, inverse cosine, is a sign, and I don't want to be counting on my memory <clears throat> to make sure the sign's right. So what I would, <clears throat> sorry, would be go back to the back of the book again under differentiation and go under inverse trigonometric functions and derivative with respect to x. This is number 19. This is like the third or fourth page from the back of that card stock, card stock page that says differentiation, inverse trigonometric function, it's number 19, d by dx of inverse sine is what? You see it? Okay. Now, notice what cosine is? Exactly the same, except for it's a negative. Okay, so that's why I don't like to try to memorize these. I want to make sure I'm using the right one. So I always look it up. Okay. But I do know that. Okay, now because that's the derivative, guess what? The integral of 1 over, are they still using x? I think they, no. Yeah. Yeah, 1 over. Well, let's do it, dx over the square root of 1 minus x squared. What would that be? 
The derivative of that is this, and the antiderivative of that would be inverse sine. <clears throat> okay? And then you would have to do a plus C with it. Okay? Now, sorry, I'm running out of page there. Um, so, we can back off of this a little bit, and we know that the um, inverse sine of zero is zero, because the sine of zero is zero, so the inverse sine of zero is zero. It undoes the other. So then you can then rewrite <coughs> your function inverse sine of x, and what I'll do is I think I'll blow this up now that I've got everything written on here. Um, the inverse sine of x is in the integral from 0 to x because it's 0 inverse sine of 0, so it's 0 to x dt is that. Okay? You just change, since x is here, you change that to some other variable. Anything other than x. Y, R, S, you know, U, V, it doesn't matter what you call it, but just have the only variable in there. And this is how you define inverse sine of and ever find that is that energy. Now, <coughs> this has limits too, just like the limit for the log was, uh, the x had to be greater than uh, zero. Could be equal to zero, could be less than zero. Well, now for this one, and you can almost tell looking at that, your, your t's here obviously have to be minus one to one, right? It can't be minus one, because if it's minus one, one minus minus one squared would be one, that'd be one minus one is zero, you can't divide by zero. So you have to be between minus one and one. Anything less than one, fine. Or in between minus one and one is fine. Anything outside of that is going to give you some yeah, irrational number. So, a uh, complex number. So you want x's have to be minus one and one. But that was where inverse sine is defined. Okay? That's the only place it's defined. It's in minus one and one. Now inverse sine is defined at minus one and one, but you can't use it for this definition because then you would have zero in your denominator. Okay. So the next thing they give you here is here is the figure that goes with that. This is the inverse sine <coughs> function. I'll blow this up too. And again, let me just aggravates me that. This is so awkward. Okay. Let me blow this up. Okay. Uh, this is a graph of 1 over 1 minus the square root of 1 minus t squared. Okay, when t is equal to 1, uh, well, yeah, this is 1. When t is equal to 0, this is 1. When t is equal greater than this, it's slightly different because you see 1 minus a pretty small number, it's going to be far off from 1, but then as you get closer and closer to 1, this thing gets closer and closer to 0, 1 over 0 is going to be a huge number, <coughs> or getting close to 0, same thing here, so this is the graph of that, and <coughs> this is your area of your inverse sine, 0 to x. Now, in this case, if you flipped them and made the, uh, your x negative, then sure enough, you do have a negative area there, okay? Uh, because this works anywhere between minus and one. Not at minus one or one, because they're not, those are vertical asymptotes. 
Now, why do you need this? I'm not sure. I mean, they like to show it. There it is. Okay. Now. The next slide they show here is are your other inverse trig functions. And those are the same ones in the table in the back. And frankly, use the table in the back. Okay, because, uh, and they don't even show all of them. They just show uh, sine, tangent, and secant, which is a little bizarre. But what cosine would be with the minus sign here. Cotangent would have a minus sign here, and cosecant would have a minus sign there. That's the only difference. Okay. Uh, but do I bother trying to memorize these? No, because I'm afraid I'm going to get a sign wrong or something like that. Look them up. Okay. If you're a memorizer and that helps you learn, go for it. There they are. But I always look them up. Okay. And you see that because the root of that is that, the integral of that would be these things plus okay. those tables over again. Okay. Now, does that mean you don't want to ever use these? No, you will be using these. Uh, oh, one more slide before we move on. Here is the inverse tangent slide. And again, uh, this is 1 over x squared plus 1, because that is the derivative of the inverse tangent. So the inverse tangent is the area under here from 0 to x. So, <coughs> when x is equal to uh, 1, this will be 1 over 2. Do the the math on that, you'll find out the area is pi fourths. Is that the first problem? I think it is. Yeah. Sorry. I hate it when they do that. Uh, but let's actually do that. Okay. Okay. Uh, here we go. Evaluate this. The integral from 0 to 1 of dx over 1 plus x squared, or x squared plus 1. Doesn't matter which order you write that. Okay. Now, what I would do, go look in the back of the book to see what that integral is. We've just seen it. We know what it is. That's going to be, do you know? Inverse tangent of x evaluated from 0 to 1. Okay? Now, what do we mean when we go into evaluate? This is a definite integral. That would be then the inverse tangent of 1 minus the inverse tangent of 0. Okay? Now, what do we mean by inverse tangent of 1? Okay, remember what inverse functions do. They undo the function they're the inverse of. So, when I see something like this, you want to give that a value, I would say, don't use x, but you can use any other variable you want to. Give me a variable. Make up something. Why? Why not? Why not? Okay. So we'll do y is equal to inverse tangent of 1. Now, can you write me an equivalent equation to that, but not using the inverse? Tangent of y is equal to 1. Because a, tangent, a function and its inverse function 
exchange X's and Y's. Okay? Okay? Now, can you give me an angle, preferably in radians, whose tangent is 1? Okay? 45 degrees. That's why I said preferably in radians. He gives me in degrees. No, okay, that's absolutely right. 45 degrees. What is that in radians? What is 90 degrees in radians? What's 180 degrees in radians? 45 is what? Pi fourths, exactly. Okay. You can use a piece of paper if you want to, but think of this. 2 pi radians is 360 degrees. Pi radians is 180 degrees. Pi halves radians is? 90 degrees, pi force would be half of 90, which would be 45 degrees, right? Okay, so this would be pi force. Y is equal to pi force. So this one is pi force minus, and what's the inverse tangent of zero? It is zero, minus zero, so that is pi force. And that's how they got the area of being pi force. The integral from 0 to 1 of the, this function here, which is the derivative of the inverse tangent, that would be the inverse tangent, the inverse tangent evaluated from 0 to 1 would be pi force. So that's how they came up with it. I hate it when they show the answer, but don't show you how to work the problem. Okay. They sort of did, but the slide didn't. Okay. Now, the next one is example two. Let's do that one. I think I'll go to a clean page on this. So we'll go to a white screen. And that will be evaluate this. The integral from 1 over root 2 to 1 of dx over x times the square root of 4x squared minus 1. Okay. Now, if you got your book open to the right page, you can look up there and see, does this look like any of the integrals that we see there? It looks awfully close to equation 4 in that box at the top of the page, but not quite. Right? Now, one thing that's left off, it doesn't have absolute value in it. Well, the reason you don't need an absolute value in it is these are both positive numbers, and every number in between, 1 over root 2 and 1, are going to be positive numbers, so you don't need the absolute value there, okay? Now, <clears throat> so it looks a lot like a secant, ex or inverse, inverse secant, but the problem is that uh, is not an x squared, it's a 4x squared. So, this leads you to think we might need something. In fact, it's the title of what the problem is using substitution. We want just something squared there, okay? So the substitution I would recommend is let, what variable you want to name this? U, that's why I thought everybody would say that. U is equal to, how about 2x? Now, why would I choose 2x? Because u squared would be yeah, 2 squared x squared, which is 4x squared. And that's what we got, right? So that's what we want. That will be our u squared. Uh, so therefore, u squared will be 4x squared, right? Okay. But we also need something else here. Then, if u is 2x, 
What do we do next? DU is equal to Second. 2dx. Very good. Well, we don't have a 2dx. We just have a dx, so what will we do? Divide both sides by 2. Which means when we do our transition here, we will have du up top, but we'll need a 1 half out front. Okay? Oops. We got another problem. Here we have an x, so what is x? If u is 2x, this also implies that, another implication here, what is x? If u is equal to 2x, what is x? Solve for x. u over 2. Okay, so we have an x down here, and I want to write a u over 2 there. Okay, but that's in the denominator. So uh, 1 over x will be a 2 over u, right? All right, so this gets our x there, but now we bring a 2 on the outside. But that 2 on the outside, and that 2 from before, that goes back to being 1, okay? So that gives you your du over 2, your u over 2, which flips it over and makes it 2 over u, okay? And the 2's cancel out. And then this would be the square root of u squared, because 4x squared was u squared, minus 1. Now we've got something we can do. But what have we forgotten to do? What do we do about our values there? The limits on the integration. With x going from 1 over root 2 to 1, so u would be going from u equal 2 times 1 over root 2. That would be 2 over root 2, which, by the way, is the same as root 2, right? Do you buy that? Because is it 2, root 2 times root 2? Is it? Yeah, right? Okay. So, that would be our lower limit, root 2. And if our upper limit is 1 for x, then u would be, if x is 1, u is 2 times x. 2 times 1 is 2. Right? Okay. Now we're ready to do the integration. Okay? This is exactly the form you have in equation 4 above. Right? Just everywhere you say x, put a u in its place, and you've got... Uh, exactly this integral, okay? So this is going to be secant u. Inverse secant u, I'm sorry. Inverse secant of u. Okay? Evaluated from u is equal root 2 to 2. So this will be what? Inverse secant of 2 minus inverse secant of root 2. And guess what? You can't do much with that except maybe evaluate it. Okay? Now, <clears throat> um, now somehow you're supposed to know these, and I think you probably do. But let's go back. Here's what I would suggest. Let's draw a little uh, angles here. Okay? 
we are in the first quadrant, so I think we're okay here. And what we have a secant is SE. Let's do a, not a unit circle, but a circle of radius 2. Okay. I think we're okay with this. We may come back and change that. But circle of radius 2. That doesn't look much like a circle. Or it's pretty ugly, but anyway, you can live without it. Okay. What is secant? Secant is, remember in your trig, that would be... Um, R over X, right? Does that make sense? Because it's reciprocal of cosine. Cosine would be X over R, right? So secant would be R over X. Well, R here is 2. That's the radius. So 2 divided by, uh, and your X here is 1. This is 2 over 1. So your radius 2 over 1. What would be this angle right here? Okay. This is 1, 2. This would be the square root of 3. Right? Looks like a familiar angle. What is that? So it's 60 degrees. You think in degrees. I do too. Which is pi thirds. Okay. So this thing right here is pi thirds thirds. That's that angle. Inverse tangent, inverse secant, the answer to that is an angle. What angle gives you a secant of 2? Okay. Secant of what angle is equal to 2? Okay, now let's do the same for, thing for the square root of 2. Alright. In this case, it's a little messier. Uh, I'm going to draw my circle to begin with and call this root 2 here and root 2 here, okay? And so this is root 2 over 1. Well, root 2 is 1.414. So this would be 1, and that would be 0.414. So this would be something like that, right? This is the square root of 2 here, and this is the square root of 2 here because, no, I'm sorry, sorry, I said that backwards, Ack. <clears throat> okay, let me make sure I'm thinking right again, yeah, it's root 2 over 1, okay, so this is your root 2, and this is your 1 here, okay, Right? Your x value. What angle does that sort of look like? 45, okay? Or, in radians, that would be minus pi fourths. We just did that one. So that's what our answer is. Pi thirds minus pi fourths. Okay? Now, if you wrote that least common denominator, that would be 4 twelfths pi minus 3 twelfths pi is pi twelfths. Or you could do whatever that is, point whatever that is, pi twelfths. That's the answer they get. All right. Okay. Most of the difficulty here is remembering your trick, right? All right. Okay, with example two. Example three says we're going to need substitution again. Let's see how that works. Now, on any other thing, you could clear the screen. Here, what we have to do is unwhite the screen and then go back and white the screen over again. Strange way to do this. This is screencast-o-matic. Okay. Example 3. Evaluate this one. The integral from 0 to 3 fourths of d 
dx over the square root of 9 minus 16 x squared. The square root of 9 minus 16 x squared. Okay. Now, if you look up the page, that kind of looks a little like your inverse sine, okay? But not quite, okay? We got to do some monkeying around to make it look like that. Now, what kind of monkeying do you think we have to do? Substitution, let u equal what? Huh? Okay. Now. Okay. Here's what. Here's ultimately what we want, isn't it? Tell me if I'm not right here. We want this thing here. Nine minus sixteen x squared to be one minus u squared. If we had that 1 minus u squared, that is an inverse sine perfectly, right? All right, so what can we do to make that happen? Well, let's solve for u. So let's uh, add a u squared to both sides and subtract a 9 and add a 16x squared to both sides. Okay, and that would be u squared is equal to, these go out, and 1 minus 9 would be negative 8, these go out, plus 16x squared. I'm not liking this very much at all. Ah. Uh, This is not very pretty, is it? There's got to be a better way. Okay. Yeah. It's what I thought this would lead to, but it's really messy getting there. Okay. Well... Let's erase this. Okay. I think maybe it'll get there, but it's going to be a long way to get there. So let's... The other way to do this is the way they do in the book, which is what I started to do, but I thought maybe the other one would be cleaner. It's not. Okay. You want this to be a 1 here, so the first thing we're going to do is divide inside everything on the inside by 9 okay and then that means you have to multiply on the outside by 3 because the 9 is inside the, ra the radical square root of 9 is 3 so you're dividing everything inside by the square root of by 3 which is the square root of 9 so you have to multiply on the outside by 3. It doesn't look fair, but it's right, right? Because 3 over the square root of 3 is 1, right? You buy that? Okay. So i just doing the square root of 3 on the inside. I mean, square root of 9 on the inside and 3 on the outside. 1 over the square root of 9. So this will be 3 times the square root of... 1 minus 4x over 3 squared. Sorry, it's messy. Okay, now we'll do our substitution. Let's let u equal 4x over 3. Okay, and then we know this will imply that u squared is equal to 16x squared over 9, and that's exactly what we have there. 
<clears throat> so I think we're happy there. Uh, what's your DU? Yuck! This is so aggravating. Uh, oh no. I can't go back to my white screen. Okay. I really dislike this program if you haven't noticed already. It just does whatever it wants to. Okay. What have we got so far? We had we had the integral from zero to three fourths of dx over the square root of 9 minus 16x squared. We said let u equal uh, 4 thirds x. This is where we were. Then du is equal to 4 thirds x. No, I'm sorry. 4 thirds dx. Okay, four thirds dx. Okay. So, from there we say that three fourths du is equal to dx. Okay. But remember what we were wanting to do before. We had a three on the outside here. So, what that was was. Uh, square root of 9 minus 16x squared is 3 times this, and this is 3 times the square root of 1 minus 4 thirds x squared. That's what we were doing. You had a 3 on the outside of that, but that's in the denominator. You had a 3 on the numerator here, so it's a 1 3rd times four, 3 fourths. <clears throat> so the 3's go out, and that leaves you just a 1 fourth. <clears throat> du, okay, because the fourth, 3 fourths were already pulled out, over um, the square root of 1 minus u squared. Okay. So, now, we've done all that, except we haven't changed our limits, have we? So when x was 0, what is u? x is 0, what's u? 0. Okay, so our limits here, since we changed the u's, make that 0. Nothing changed there. But when x was 3 fourths, what is our u? One, okay, four thirds times three fourths is one. So that's zero to one. And when we do that, this comes up being one over four times the inverse sine of one minus inverse sine of zero. Okay. Now, what's the inverse sign of 1? Pi over 2. So 1 fourth of pi halves. And what's the inverse sign of 0? Zero? 0, yeah. So this will be pi 8s is our answer. I hope, I think, yes it is. Okay. Now they sort of do that, <clears throat> but they sure skip a lot of steps. Okay. Well, kind of, but not really. I mean, yeah. Okay. 
Now, the next um, transcendental function we're going to deal with is an exponential function. Not e to the x, but b to the x. Okay? So let's start with that. And let's see, I think I unwhite the screen here. Have y'all got this? Okay. Unwhite the screen in advance one. Okay. Before we do that, let's start with the function f of x is equal to b to the x. Now remind me how you do the derivative of that. d of b to the x Well, this is so aggravating, okay? All right. Let's start all this stuff over again, which means sit here and wait, and then change this, that, do this, that, that. All right, back where we were. Okay, we're going to let, no, I've got to also do this. This is such a pain. Okay. F of X equal B to the X. And my question to you was then what is D by dx of b to the x. Now, this is a power function, so don't do what I think you might be tempted to do. Do b, to, I mean, x times b to the x minus 1. Don't do that, okay? <laughs> That's a mess, okay? How are we going to take the derivative of that? Now, one answer is look it up in the back of the book, okay? But I think we can really do this. If f of x is equal to that, let's write that in a slightly different way. What if we took the log of this? The log, natural log, of f of x would then be the natural log of b to the x, right? Wouldn't you agree to that? Okay. Now, one of our log rules says we can do what? Now, this is legal here. That is the same as x times the natural log of b. Do you buy that? Yeah, okay. One of the rules of logarithm. Now, if we were to take an exponential of both of those, the exponential of a natural log would give you what? Hint, they're inverse functions of each other. That would get you back to f of x, wouldn't it? An inverse of an inverse gives you whatever you started with, okay? And that would be e to the x log b. So, since I don't know how to do that, well, I do know, but I'm going to pretend I don't. This is the same as, because this is what f of x is b to the x, so this is b to the x, okay? So what I'm going to do is d of e to the x log b dx. I think I can do that one because I know what the derivative of, of e to the x log b is. What is that? Derivative of exponential function is itself e to the x log b times chain rule no times log b the chain rule okay you do the derivative of the inner outer function e to the x that would be e, e to the s then you do the derivative of the inner function this is just some constant times x so that would be that constant okay now we're almost there. 
e to the x log b is e to the x, so that derivative would be log b times b to the x, okay? Um, and that's exactly what you see at the top of the page, okay? So the derivative of that, of b to the x would be that. So if we did b to the x over log b and took the derivative of that, okay, that would be 1 over log b, because that's just a constant, okay, times, this is going in circles it feels like, log b, b to the x, log b's go out and that gives you b to the x. So we know what the derivative of this thing gives us that, so now we know that the integral of this gives us that. And that's exactly what we are showing here. That the integral of b to the x is going to be b to the x over log b plus c. Okay? Now, is that worth memorizing? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. That's up to you. But what if that b was e? Integral of e to the x is e to the x divided by log e. Well, log e is 1. Okay, so I'll say undo e of it. So sure enough, that works. So if you can just remember that, yeah, you can do any power function, I mean exponential function that way. And then, of course, you need your plus c. Okay? Now, this is the last slide, so I'm just going to go to my white screen here, and we'll do example four. Or maybe I should have cleared that. Okay, we can look and see. The integral from three to five of seven to the x power dx. Okay. First thing you ask yourself, what's the antiderivative of 7 to the x? Seven to the x divided by log seven. You're absolutely right. Evaluate that from three to five. Okay? And that would be what? I'm going to pull out the 1 over log 7, because that's going to be in front of everything. Okay, I probably should have done it in the previous step. Just a constant. Pull it on the outside. And that would be 7 to the 5th minus 7 to the 3rd. Okay? And unfortunately, there's no rules here that make that any easier. You just have to do the evaluation. Okay, so 7 raised to the 5th power minus 7 raised to the 3rd power. Going to do that on the calculator because I don't want to do that in my head. I can't. <laughs> it would be a misery. And then divide that by log 7. And what would be your answer? Okay, what do you say? 8460.8 is what they have in the book. Is that what you get in your calculator? It's just a big number, okay? And this, by the way, is an approximate equal to. It's not exact. It's an irrational number, so it goes on forever. Okay? How are we doing on time? We okay? Okay. So let's do example five then. Evaluate this one. The integral from zero to pi halves. Sounds like a trig function to me. Cosine of theta 10 to the sine theta better be a d theta. Oh yeah, you have to leave early. That's what you told me. Okay, 
15 points and said, yeah, okay, got it. All right. All right. Now, what might you want to do here? Yes, let's do a substitution. What do you want to substitute? Let u equal what? Sine theta. Sine theta. Sounds good. Then du is equal to cosine theta d theta. And there we have a cosine theta d theta. So my new integral becomes the integral from the cosine theta d theta is du, and this would be 10 to the Second. Sine theta was what? U. 10 to the U du. Okay. Now, we still have to change our limits. So when theta is equal to 0, what is sine theta? That would be 0, so U would be 0. And when theta is equal to pi halves, sine of pi halves is 1, so U would be 1. Okay, I think we can handle that. So this would be ten to the u over ln of ten, and we evaluate that from zero to one. Okay? Now again I'm going to pull out that one over ln of ten. It's just a number. And then this would be 10 to the 1 minus 10 to the 0. And what would that be? What's 10 to the first power? Ten. And what's ten to the zero at power? One. Ten minus one is nine over log ten. Nine over log ten. And then you can just evaluate that. Nine divided by the ln of ten. Don't do the log of ten, but the ln of ten. Second. Okay. Three. Okay. They call it three point nine one. And that's good enough for me. Those are a few of your transcendental functions. I'm very thankful they didn't get into uh, hyperbolics because they seem like just a math exercise. So I'm sure someone must use them, but they have math definitions that go from there. They do have a little summary here, and then they have some preliminary questions. You want to do the preliminary questions? You find them helpful? All right, so let's do the preliminary questions. What I have to do here is, believe it or not, unwhite the screen and then white the screen. It's so bizarre. Okay. The first preliminary question says, find B. So we're looking for B. Such that, and that's sometimes a vertical line or a colon sometimes, the integral from 1 to b of dx over x is equal to a log 3, b 3, okay? So, help me out here, what is the integral from 1 to b of dx over x. The, forget about the limits. What's the antiderivative of dx over x? ln of x. Okay, so this would be ln x evaluated from 1 
to be. So this would be ln of a b minus ln of 1. What's the log of 1? No, log of 1 is 0. Okay, so this is just log b. Okay, so guess what log b has to be if log b is equal, guess what b has to be if log b is equal to log 3? Okay, if this thing is equal to that thing, what does b have to be? 3, yeah, b equal 3, okay? Now, what would b have to be if log b is equal to 3? What would b have to be? How do you solve that for b? What undoes a log function? The what? It is, it's the uh, inverse of the ln. And what's ln? Inverse of ln. Natural log. Okay. Okay, wait, wait. I'm going to draw them for you. Here's what natural log looks like. So it's inverse function. I'll do a different color. Uh, I'm first going to do red because the inverse function is reflecting over the identity function. So what color you want me to draw this new function as? Green. green? I think you like green, don't you? Okay. I'll do a darker green here. It would be something that goes like that. What function does that look like? This is 1, 0. I should do that in black. This is 0, 1. Increasing exponential energy. E function the inverse of log, log the inverse of energy. So this would be that. So how you undo that, let's go back to black again. So B, <laughs> I thought I went back to black, I went back to. All right. So B would be E to the 3. All right, so the first one, B would be 3. The second one, B would be E to the 3. Okay, let's see if I can find this in the back. It's somewhere back here. This is 5, 8, B is equal to 3, and the B part is B is equal to E to the 3. Got it. All right, number 2. Same kind of a thing except different, okay? So let's, uh, here I have to unwhite the screen and rewhite the screen. Ah, it's so stupid. All right. Two, again, is find B such that the integral from zero to B of dx over 1 plus x squared is equal to pi thirds. Okay? Now, what is that integral equal to? You can look either just above this preliminary question at your summary or look on the previous page at the top of the page. That's not sine. Sine has a square root of 1 minus x squared. Tangent, yes. This would be the tangent, the inverse tangent of x evaluated from 0 to b. You want that to equal to pi thirds, right? So this would be the inverse tangent of what? Well, 
of B minus the inverse tangent of zero. What's the inverse tangent of zero? Yes, so that would be, so this would then be equal to pi thirds. Because what angle, when you take this tangent, will give you pi thirds? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. The tangent of pi thirds gives you what, what uh, value? That's what this says. You rewrite this with the inverse function, and that would be tangent of pi thirds is equal to b. And what is the tangent of pi thirds? All right. Yes. What's that? Okay. What do you say? Pi thirds is 60 degrees. And what's tangent of 60 degrees? Okay. Yeah, you can go there. Or you can do a unit circle. Okay. 60 degrees up here. The y here. The x here is 1. I like to do it this. This is not the unit circle. The, the two unit circle, two square root of three. Okay? That's your 60 degree. Okay? So the tangent is opposite over adjacent. So that B would equal to the square root of three. All right? All right, let's see if they got it right in the back. How did they do? Two is b is equal to square root of three. They got it right. Good for them. Okay. Do I need to leave that up a little longer? Yeah. You got it. Okay. So then I go and unwipe my screen and wipe my screen. Goodness gracious, this is a pain in the neck. Okay. All right. Number three. Which integral should be evaluated using substitution. Okay, the A one here is 9, the integral of 9 dx over 1 plus x squared. Okay, and the B one here is the integral of dx over 1 plus 9 x squared. Which one of those should be evaluated using substitution? A or B? Or both? Or neither? Actually, if you just pull the 9 on the outside, that'd be dx of 1 plus x squared this inverse tangent. So you don't need Second one, yeah, yeah, let u equal 3x. And then du would be 3 by that one. And that would be 1 plus u squared. So b does need substitution, a doesn't. <coughs> Number three is b. Okay? And let's see if we can get four done. I don't know how we're doing on time, but let's see. What, which relation between x and u yields this? Square root of 16 plus x squared equal 4 times the square root of 1 plus u squared. So what's the relationship between x and u? In other words, let u equal y make that happen. What's that? Okay. What I'm going to do is this. The square root of 16 plus x squared is Tell me if this looks okay to you. The square root of, I'm going to factor 16 out of both of those. 16 out of 16 would be 1. And 16 out of x squared would be uh, 1 16th x squared. 
Do you buy that? Factoring a 16 out of a 16 out of 16 is one, right? Factoring a 16 out of this is one of, okay. Check it, multiply back through. That would be 16, that would be x squared, right? Okay, so that's right. Well, what is square root of 16? So that would be 4 times the square root of 1 plus 1 16th x squared. So, with that in mind, what would have to be your u? Not quite. Not u squared, but u. If you did u squared, that would be 1 16th x squared. In fact, let's do that. Let u squared equal 1 16th. I'm just going to put x squared over 16, right? But that then implies that u is equal to x over 4. That would be the substitution you would make. That's the relationship between x and u. Okay? Let's see if they got that in the back. U, uh, x is equal to 4u, or u is equal to x over 4. Either one of those is right. That's the same as uh, 4u is equal to x. x equal 4u, which I All right, good deal. Homework exercises, it would be any of the odds 1 through 9. Do number 11. Any of the odds 13 through 31, any of the odds 33 through 69, and try and do 71. Okay? Oh, 71 and or 73. 73 is a proof. If you into that, knock yourself out. It's not bad. Okay? Uh, and then if those aren't enough for you, you can do any of the odd numbers, 75 through, looks like 83. All right. Now, 5.9 is talking about exponential growth and decay. That's really interesting stuff. In fact, it's something you might want to choose to write a paper on. But since we're sort of off to a slow start, I'm sort of all in favor of skipping that one. I don't think I'm going to test you on that. Uh, so, <coughs> uh, would you rather do a slideshow of it later or just skip it altogether? Um, yeah, it, okay, it, it's just whether you'll need this in your future or not. I mean, you might or might not, I don't know. Uh, if you want me to do a slideshow, I will. Otherwise, we'll just skip it and go on to chapter 6, I think it is. Okay. So, uh, how are we doing on time? 11.02. Oh, so we got time. Well, let's, let's see. What is chapter 6? Applications of the integral. So, let's do the slideshow on this, okay? Um, we'll end the show, discard, get out of this, and we'll do, now this says section 8, and that's the old edition, the new edition is six is 5, 9. So, I, again, I don't think I'm going to test you on any of this. Uh, I will have to check and make sure I, I'm not, I don't have any test questions on this. I'm pretty sure I don't. I think this is just sort of a slideshow, uh, just so you'll be exposed to it, and if you ever need it, you can come back and figure it out. So slow. Word. It's 11.03. Unfortunately, when I get into the actual slideshow, it covers up my time here, so I can't see it. I can see it now, but as soon as this Man, this is slow. Okay. 
Okay, I think I'm going to click it again to see. Let's see. Ah. Okay, I'm going to click it again. I don't know what it's doing, but it's not doing anything. I can tell it's self flickering. Now it actually. Yeah, okay, good. Finally. Okay, we'll go to the current slide. And then I have to hide presenter view because otherwise that's what gets saved on screencast o -Matic. All right. Since I'm mostly just going to be talking about this, this is an example of exponential growth or exponential decay. Now, what's the difference? Do you know? Yeah, this is P, which you can say some value, P, as a function of time, is your initial whatever that value is, E to the KT. Okay? If K is positive, This is exponential growth. If K is negative, it's exponential decay. Okay? That's the difference. Now, what are some examples of this? Okay? When you hear exponential decay, what comes to mind? Anything? Exponential growth or exponential decay? Okay, let me give you a dumb example of exponential growth. Okay? Is your background Indian? No. Oh, it's not. Sri Lanka? Sri Lanka? Oh, really? Uh, uh, Tamil or, or yeah. Sinhalese? Okay. okay. Uh, we have really good friends who are from Madras or Chennai, India, but Nalini's family is from Sri Lanka. So, uh, so we've got some really good people in Sri Lanka and several other really nice things that the family has said over the years. All right, but what I was going to say is the game of chess, now this is supposedly true, I don't know that for sure it is, it was developed by an Indian mathematician, okay? But it was back when India, way before it was a country, it was regions or things, you know, I'm going to call it, the leader of Maharaji. I don't know. Would that be close to true? Okay. Uh, this one big leader, ruler, fell in love with this game of chess. He said, fine, who developed this? I want to reward this character because oh, this is just the best game ever. Well, they went around, found this little uh, uh, mathematician, you know, used to not getting a lot of attention, and brought him before the big powerful ruler, he said, ask me anything up to half my kingdom, I will grant it to you, whatever, what would you, oh, Saeed or whatever you want to call it, no, 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 if you if you find pleasure in it, that's more than enough reward for me, no, don't, no, 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 I insist, I want to reward you, name it. So he pulled out a chessboard, okay, the chessboard has, like a checkerboard, eight rows and eight columns square eight by eight. He said, oh, if you'll just put a single grain of wheat in that first square, okay, and then double the number of grains of wheat in each subsequent square, that would be enough. Oh, no, 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 no. I mean something worthwhile. No, no, that, that, that's more than enough. So they started off one grain, two grains, four grains, eight grains, 16 grains, uh, you know, on up. The first row had probably 100 grains or less. But then as you kept doubling and doubling and doubling each one, before you even got halfway through the board, he would have emptied every granary in the kingdom. And before he got to the last square, there had been more grains of wheat than had ever been raised on the planet, historically, ever. 
Raji felt like the guy was making a fool of him, so he cut his head off. So okay, that was a, supposedly the end of the story. That's exponential growth. I mean, it goes up really, really fast. So this could have been one, the first grain of wheat, and this would have been rather than E, this would have two decays of okay, and you have double the intensity. And you do this for 64. And if you got a calculator, what is uh, 2 raised to the 64th power? 64th power. It may not even be it. Times 10 to the, to the 19th power. That is a lot of grains of wheat. <laughs> that would be, what was it? One, what did you do it? One, eight, four, four. Okay, well, just stop somewhere there and then put the rest of those digits in zeros. So you get a total of 18 digits following, 19 digits following the one. And that's how many grains of wheat. Okay, there's a lot of wheat. Okay, so that's exponential growth. Okay, things that use this, for instance, would be um, bacteria. Uh, they grow exponentially, and here's another sort of dumb example. Okay. If I say a pickle jar, does that mean anything to you? Pickle jar, yeah. Okay, my mother, I grew up on a farm. And my mother had this big, I think it was a three-gallon jug, jar, and she would put her cucumbers in there and then put very salty water, okay, brine. And uh, she, of course, washed them and everything first, put them in there and let them soak, and that was called the pickle jar, you know. And then she'd take them out and put them in vinegar and boil them and stuff, and that's how she made her pickles, so depending on what kind of pickles. Sweet pickles add some sugar in there. Other things. But anyway, that was basic. I probably said that wrong, but that's what it looked like to me. Okay, so let's say we had this three gallon jar of, and we're going to fill it not with pickles, but with the very best, perfect growth medium for growing the certain type of bacteria. Okay? All right. Now I'm going to put a single bacterium in that jar. Okay, and I'm going to let you tell me. You make up uh, the time that you think it'll take that bacterium to split and make two bacteria. In other words, it's doubling time. Give me the time. So in seconds, minutes, hours, days? One second. One second, okay. Uh, in one second, it's going to double. Okay. Now, it's a single bacterium. You can not even see it, probably. It's going to double every second. Okay. Now, uh, when you make up another time, anytime you want to, that jar is going to be absolutely full of bacteria. How long do you think that'll be? You just make up a time. Uh, 30, minutes. 30 minutes. Okay. When would the jar be half full of bacteria? Bacteria. Yeah. 15 minutes? Huh? Twenty-nine minutes and fifty-nine seconds. Because guess what? It's gonna double every second. You said right. And if it's gonna be full at thirty minutes, it'll be half full at twenty-nine minutes and fifty-nine seconds. Because the next second it's gonna double again. Ah, uh, yeah, right. Okay, that's exponential growth. It's amazing. Okay. So things that are growing exponentially, unfortunately. Our consumption of fossil fuels is growing exponentially. It's not just a linear growth, it's an exponential growth. Now it's a pretty small K. It's not negative, but it's pretty small. It may be 0 0.001. But guess what? It's still growing exponentially. So, since it is growing exponentially, 
and there's only a finite amount of fossil fuels available. I mean, right? They are things that decay hundreds of thousands of thousands of something years ago. So there's not, you know, there's some fixed amount. We don't know how much, okay? But if there's that exponential growth, some point it's going to be that doubling period, right? At some point, maybe a pretty long time. But guess what? Before we run out, when we have half the amount that we need, we're only going to have that one more period to make a decision. What are we going to do next? Okay, and guess what? We're still increasing. We don't know when we're going to run out, but the odds are we're not going to have time enough to come up with alternative fuels then. We need to run out. I mean, these are examples of exponential growth. Exponential decay. Can you think of anything that decays exponentially? Radiation. Oh, and by the way, exponential growth, another thing I mentioned bacteria, that's also in your food, okay? All food has a little bit of bacteria in it, right? And you take it out of the fridge and let it sit on the table, that decay gets a bigger, faster, and it might be perfectly fine to eat at some time, but then maybe five minutes or an hour later, it's going to be so many bacteria and you're going to get sick. Your body can fight off a few, but it can't fight off an army. Okay, so another example of exponential growth. Uh, really, another is the spread of the disease. Okay, that's the same type thing. Bacteria and growth, yeah, and so and people getting exposed, and that's exponential growth. At least until the whole population gets exposed, and then stop. But in between there, it's pretty steep. Okay, exponential decay. What's that? Second. Trees. Yeah, with trees. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, the. Yeah. Decay. Yeah, the yeah the rate at which we are probably destroying, say, the rainforest, is probably an exponential function right now. With a, it's a minus k, but the 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 amount of trees available is probably declining at an exponential rate. And now that doesn't go down as fast, but it's still, yeah, it still is an exponential function. That that would be an example. Another would be you've heard of radioactive decay, as in you know, uh, uranium or plutonium or radon or some of these others, they all have what they call half lives. And after a certain period of time half of it disappears not disappears, it's become something else because the radioactive isotope has done its natural decay process and become something else. Like radi uh, radium, or uranium decays to radium, radium decays to polonium, you know, it, it has a cycle that it goes through. So those are examples of exponential decay. Okay. Okay, we just used more than <laughs> all of this. This is supposed to be a, a quick slideshow. Okay. We'll start next time, actually, with this picture, uh, and I'll go much faster next time because we're going to let the other class decide. But just they get to hear it if they want I'm to. Sorry, sir.